Hey, welcome to The Perspective again. I'm Mike Sherbino, and this summer, how's it going for you? Are you enjoying your summer? You know, do you have a little bit of rain, a little bit of sun, a little, you're not too sure where it's going? Well, regardless of how you might be feeling today, we want to bring encouragement to you all this week. Some amazing guests that come and talk to you about financing, self-esteem for girls and women. That's going to be interesting. A very famous son of an international best-selling author is going to be with us. And a pastor who works within the inner city, along with a renowned world writer. You know, there's so much for you to enjoy this week on The Perspective. And anytime you miss a program, you can go to theperspective.tv. But every week I give out a promise. And the promise today, I believe specifically for you to hold on to, is found in Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, be still and know that I'm God. Quiet in your heart to know that God is there. He is with you. He is present. Enjoy watching with us today's program. You know, one of the interesting things about addictions is maybe you've been just processing briefly as you listen to the introduction is that it's easy to deny that it's actually impacting you, that I'm addicted, that I struggle with something. We often think it's the worst thing, you know, whether it's a drug addiction or alcohol. But, you know, Mitch, addictions hit us in different ways and the whole impulsive nature. What makes us do things is, is quite an intriguing journey. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, Mike, from my own life, I mean, I'm able to laugh this off sometimes, but during the COVID pandemic, Uber Eats was a big thing for me. It's late at night. You know what? I'm not talking to anybody. Uber Eats. And it's funny a couple times, but you get to the point where I'm saying, you know what? This isn't good for my money, for my health. And so even navigating that impulsivity, right? It's easy and I wanted it, right? Well, you know, my problem this past week is my wife's been traveling. She's been visiting our daughters on the other side of the country. And I happened to find buried in the freezer out in the garage a packet of cookies. That's good. And I walked by there and uh, the temptation, the impulsiveness. Yep. Well, that's a, that's a little bit of the lighter side. Sure. But, you know, yeah. the reality of addiction is that it can just wear us out. It can tear us down. And so today we are welcoming to the show to help us talk about this, Peter Marinelli. And Peter is a recovered alcoholic, but he's also a sought after speaker. And both he and his wife have started a recovery program named Through the Archway that's grounded in spiritual principles. Peter, I wanna thank you for coming on The Perspective today. We've been looking forward to this. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You know, it's such a broad subject and we want to uh, protect the reality that people have struggles. And so I just wanna come right up front and say that, that I'm struggling. I, I'm a broken person. We all need help. But take us back to your own journey and what led to the addictions that you had to fight because Sometimes it happens so subtly, doesn't it? It just seems to show up for me. Um, I was about early 20s, and um, I took a look around at my life, and I says, how did I get here? That wasn't the game plan. Uh, I, I, I grew up in New York and uh, come from a, a loving family. Uh, however, on my mom's side of the family, there was uh, lots of addiction. And, uh, you know, I would sit in treatment center after treatment center with many therapists trying to figure out where this began. And a very wise man said, we can spend our life figuring out where it came from. We need to pay attention to what we want to do about it. And I approach a lot of challenges in life with what am I going to do about it? Um, you know, at 14 years old, I have my first beer, and at 28 years old, I'm homeless, panhandling, and living wow. in an abandoned building in Lower Manhattan. Wow, that, that's that's a hard one. And you know, as you say that, Peter, yesterday I was uh, driving uh, here in in our city, and. I see lots of homeless people as you have, and I drove by a fellow that, you know, it's five o'clock at night, and he's in a sleeping bag, and he's just sleeping on the grass. And I struggled because I think I could have done more to help him. And it's a helpless situation. Did you feel helpless when you were at that point, or were you oblivious? Oh, God. Um, there's a point where you actually take a look at your condition, and you realize, for me, I can't get out. 
I'm so far gone, I can't get out. This is my life. Um, what God does in his infinite mercy for me is brought me to the bitter end, where, if you will, uh, figuratively speaking, I'm hanging off a cliff and there are no other options. And at that place, I remember it was June of 1988, and I begged my God please take me from this. I don't want to die. And my life has been rocketed since. I suddenly had this, this huge um, need to get right with God for him to save me, because at the end of the day, the only power that can uh, revolutionize, transform my life and many others is this power called God. It's a long road for many of us to get there. A lot of things get need to get out of the way. Wow. And just real quick, with respect to the homeless, uh, to be transparent, you know, when I was younger and I would see homeless, I, I would walk by them and, and, and be critical of them. And uh, I became one of them. And my wife and I, since uh, we uh, have taken on this new life, uh, we uh, are out there. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to say it. I don't want to blow my own horn, but taking care of these folks, giving them money, buying them food and talking to them. It's unbelievable what happens when you speak to someone who's uh, less fortunate in that kind of condition. And you look them in the eye and you ask them, hey, watch your name. My name is Peter. This is my wife, Marion. For a moment, everything stops because they're given just a little bit of dignity for that brief moment. They're given a little bit of respect. And that's how my heavenly father would want me to treat. It's easy to be nice to people who are doing well. Can it be light, nice to those who are unlovable? Wow. So, Peter, let me ask you, in the midst of, uh, in the midst of your addiction, how did you come to that point where you said, I know that I need to go to a loving God who uh, cares about me and has an interest in my life. How was it that you were able to say, because you said it a moment ago, this is the only thing that can help me. How come you weren't thinking, oh, maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try a program. Maybe I'll just uh, go cold turkey and do it myself. How did you know that it was only God? I tried all of those things. I was out of options. And quite frankly, the way I looked at it, I was surrendered. God came to me and his infinite mercy, that's what he does. And um, I don't know how we are on time, but I, I will tell you a re very brief story. I was uh, lying on the floor in this building and um, I was uh, really sick. I, I weigh about 200 pounds now. I was about 130 pounds and I was uh, in serious trouble. And I went to get up off the floor to go panhandle, go buy whiskey. Uh, because I was going through withdrawal and I collapsed. And uh, in that place, I looked up at this the ceiling in this hallway, not believing for a minute that God was going to pay attention to me, quite frankly, was Jesus. And I said, please take me from this. I don't want to die. What happened out of that was a series of circumstances of him connecting the dots. And my dad, who I hadn't seen for quite some time, found me on a street corner in New York. My dad was in a town called Atlantic City, New Jersey. And around two or 2.30 in the morning, he was jawed out of his sleep. And uh, he told his wife, I need to find my son, Peter. He said, something's telling me to go find him. And she thought a lunacy commission should be appointed for him. But he went from this town called Atlantic City to the Lower East Side of New York City, that's about a four hour drive, and drove through the neighborhood and found me standing on a street corner. And I was rescued and placed in wow. another treatment. That is powerful, just how God was moving. Uh, so powerful. Uh, we wanna come back and talk more about some of those stories. And I've got some specific questions for you, but just jump ahead in the story, in the narrative of your life, and talk to us about your ministry, your recovery program that's called Through the Archway. I find the name intriguing. Yeah, um, Pass Through the Archway, um, probably the strongest structure that's still around from the Roman days. And um, something happens when we pass through this archway, we become free. There's a lot of work prior to that. Through the archway uh, began many years ago under a different name with my mentor. And he said, we need to, we need to bring spiritual 
reality to these folks. We need to get them some soul food, some spiritual muscles. And we designed this program for folks uh, perhaps who've been through so many treatment centers and, and, and are failing. And um, so we designed a program um, and we found great success with it. And about six or seven years ago, uh, my wife and I and a couple of friends decided to take the leap and uh, begin our own program, um, uh, unhooked from any other treatment center down here in the States. And um, it's gone uh, really well. And as of about six months ago, we even partnered with a mental health facility called the Sylvia Braffman Institute. So we're handling, we're taking care of uh, folks who have mental health issues uh, with the clinical team and, and the addiction piece with the spiritual team. And it, it, we work in concert. It's, it's, it's been unbelievably well. So exciting. Peter, will you stay with us? Because we're going to take a short break. And to your viewers, stay with us as we're going to be right back with Peter Marinelli. Well, welcome back to The Perspective, everybody. Today, we're talking with Peter Marinelli, who is a recovered alcoholic, but is also a sought-after speaker and the founder of a recovery program called Through the Archway that he started with his wife. So, Peter, I want to thank you for being here. And let me ask you, would you unpack the term spiritual malady? Uh, and just tell us for myself, for folks at home, I know that's a term you've used. Spiritual malady, what is that? This lingering, chronic, progressive, conscious separation from God, which means I am now prey to anything that's out there. My own ideas, emotions, my attitudes, my thought life becomes my uh, current reality. And in order to deal with that, in order to cope with that, I will reach out for something, uh, whether it be sex, food, uh, drugs, alcohol, gambling, to deal with that, to, to remedy that. And at first it works, and then it boomerangs and it doesn't work. The problem is I am now addicted and I can't get out. And it's just a, 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 the separation, if you, in reality, there is no separation from us and, and that power, but there's a, a sense of separation between us and the spirit. So, Peter, as you begin to think of that separation, what do you say to people who are thinking, is there any hope that there can be a bridge? What is the uh, way back? Absolutely. Um, Asking for help. I mean, I know it sounds terribly cliche, but this is something, and the ego doesn't want to hear this. The ego will fight right through this. The pride will take over. But when we hit that bottom, asking for help, it, it kind of crushes the ego and there's a vacuum for God to come in. And when I'm asking for help, what I'm doing is saying, hey, can you help me pass this? I need to get out of this. I cannot do it on my own anymore. And that's the first door that opens. Um, once we begin to get uh, some traction, we have our respective 12-step fellowships out there. Folks go to church to do it. But now I'm relying and depending on a power that's not me, that's not uh, my self-reliance. Great things have happened. Miracles have happened. My own story is one of them. Well, wow. Peter, let me ask you, some people, uh, what do you say to folks at home who are saying, okay, uh, maybe I do have a problem, maybe I need to go get help, but they are afraid of the social backlash, oh, that person has a problem, they're worried that people are going to think less of them. Uh, what would you say to a person who is concerned about that? Well, I, I would say this, who cares what other people think? If my life is on the line, uh, I really need to let that go. That's ego. It, it's kind of like a silly analogy was this. If, if my life was threatened, I'm going to scream help as loud as I can. I don't care who thinks what. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm faced with this monster addiction, it's, it's devouring my life and it takes families with us. At some point, um, uh, I'm going to ask for help. And here's the thing that's so silly. People will see, I'll use me, people will see me, you know, uh, uh, crashing my car, falling down a flight of steps, passed out on a front lawn, that's really okay. But to say, hey, I need help with this problem and go to a church or to a 12-step meeting and be a responsible, productive member of my community, that's not okay. And this is what the illness does, it allows us to see inappropriately. Well, I think one of the things you're saying right now is to our viewers is that it is okay to ask for help and we need to. And one of the things we struggle with is our own personal pride. You know, I can do it. We all need help. Um, 
take a moment and uh, and do a bit of uh, an autopsy on the whole world of addictions, because many times, whether it's alcohol or drugs, it fuels us. It gives us strength for the moment, but it has, as you referred to, the boomerang effect. Unpack that for us. One of the things many folks have, whether they're in, in recovery or they're just what I call civilians, is the delusion that life is controllable and further that I can control it. And when someone has so much dis-ease and discomfort, so much noise in the head, there's a what feels like a panacea for all of it, and that's drink, drug, both gambling, sex, food, whatever it might be. Um, the problem is it stops to work after some time, and the amounts I need to kind of get okay increases. Then we get to a point where it doesn't even work anymore. But I can't get out because I've become physically and mentally, emotionally addicted to the substance, to the drug, to the alcohol. But it doesn't look that it's the great trickster. If there was a Satan, it is addiction. It is a thinking mind because it starts so very easy and fun and smooth and then bites and it doesn't let go. Peter, let me I, ask you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I'm just wondering for folks at home saying... Okay, well, can I enjoy a drink in a healthy way? Is there a way to gamble in a way that's healthy? What about uh, consuming different kinds of media? Can I do that to a certain extent without it being problematic? How do you help find out when a person has an addiction? What are some signs to watch out for? You know what? Uh, my analogy would be this. Uh, a normal average drinker um, goes on vacation, goes out with family, and orders a glass of wine at dinner, and there's no thought of, I shouldn't be doing this. Someone who's saying, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? I need to control and regulate my drinking tonight. Only people with problems think about that. That's very interesting. I was not aware of that. It's interesting because right now, I was listening to something on the radio here in Canada. January was referred to as the dry month, and they're encouraging people not to drink. Whether it has any impact on liquor sales, who knows? But they did say on a, on a secular radio station I was listening that over seven drinks in a week, you qualify as a heavy drinker. And I'm thinking back to the guys I play hockey with or sports with, and they would just laugh that off as being absurd because they could pound back a whole lot more. Any thoughts? There are a lot of heavy drinkers who are not alcoholics. In fact, some heavy drinkers drink more than alcoholics. Uh, there's a separation if we have a, an average drinker, a moderate drinker, a heavy drinker, and then the alcoholic who's in a class all by themselves. What these folks experience is something called craving, where the body demands more. They have the first drink. They have to have the second drink. They must have the third drink. The fourth drink is already on its way, and the body reacts differently than even a heavy drinker. We get stuck in, I need more, a craving, a physical allergy. There's also something else that goes on with an alcoholic that doesn't necessarily occur with their, uh, 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 a heavy drinker and certainly not an average drinker. And that is this other piece, and this is the big one, is this mental obsession that when I'm drinking, I'm thinking about more drinking, and when I'm not drinking, I'm thinking about drinking. <clears throat> I can get in. I, here's what it does. I will pay any price tomorrow to seek comfort right now. Heavy drinkers and moderate drinkers, don't, don't look at it that way. That's very helpful to hear. Peter, we only have a, about a minute left, but you gave a, a powerful speech that was entitled The Sunlight of the Spirit. Can you encapsulate in, uh, in the next 45 seconds something that was so important from that speech that you'd want our viewers to hear? to walk in God's sunlight. I only can do as good as the light I'm standing in. And he's going to any lens pursuing all of us to bring his, his mercy. Uh, it isn't a far walk. All I have to do is surrender and ask. And we get to walk in his light, bask in his glow, and suddenly we're traveling light. And the problems of yesterday seem to go by because the power that's in me is greater than the power that's out there. Peter, I just want to say thank you. And, uh, for some of the different thoughts and insights that you shared. I do believe that's been very helpful uh, to the audience and even me and Mike as we are looking to love and care for people here at North End Church. So thank you, and uh, folks at home, we'll be right back.
Mitch, what are your thoughts on the interview today? Yeah, Mike, well, I uh, opened up in the beginning. I said one of the things that I had to wrestle with during the pandemic is saying I'm spending a lot of time by myself, often lonely, and it was really easy for me to say, you know what, hit Uber Eats and receive that comfort. But one of the things I had to go through is say, you know what, am I looking for comfort in uh, cheeseburgers? And it, and it sounds trivial, it sounds funny, but that was a real thing where I said, I am finding my comfort in movies and cheeseburgers, but God says, Mitch, this is a tough situation for you, but you can find comfort in me. And I think a lot of people, whether it's alcohol or drugs or food or even social media for some people, I think we all have to go through that saying, am I finding my comfort in God who wants to love me or in something else? You know, as you talked about finding comfort, interesting phrase, there's so many things flashing through my mind just briefly, was a comment heard by one person recently and they said there were some relatives and the relatives, you know, were, would have been happy just to sit and, uh, and scroll through their phones and they spend time, hours and hours and watching our screen time is huge. Watching what goes through our mind is that right to watch what's through, thinking what's going through in mind? You know what I'm trying to say yeah. is, how do I cope with pressure, with stress? Do I reach for a drink? Do I reach for a pill? And pondering and realizing, I think of the heart doctor we had on earlier in the week. Yeah. And Dr. Sam would say, we need to realize that it's in Jesus alone that our needs are met. Mm -hmm. He is the one that can satisfy do you remember that? Well, yeah, and Mike, I think, uh, and I know we're pushing it for time, but I've just got to say what's so important, and Peter touched on it, is that even though those things may satisfy for a short time, in the end, they leave you wanting more and more and more. But Jesus says, I've come, you may have life and have it to the full. And that offer is available for you and me and for folks at home today. That's a great thing. So why don't you stay with us here in The Perspective? I'm going to be right back and open up God's Word today. I know it's going to excite your heart with what I got to share. So as we're processing all the things we've discussed on today's show, where do we go? Well, we need to go to God's Word because it has a solution. It has the answers that we need. Last week, we were talking about the importance of making a decision to abide in Christ, to read His Word, to grow stronger, because this book will change your life. And as you spend time in prayer with God, you're going to hear Him speak into your heart truth and direction, saying, this is what you need to be doing. But there's something else that we need to do. And it comes out of partly what Peter was sharing with us today. We need to choose to belong. It is so easy to be isolated. And many times when we're struggling with addictions, we just want to stay isolated. We don't want to admit that it's really the way that it is. You might not be struggling with an addiction, though, but you still need to belong. We need one another. And that's one of the teachings we find over and over in the scripture. Get connected in a local church. Get connected in a small group. My goodness, I think of story after story that has shaped my life and my wife's, and it's when we were connected in small groups and connected in a church. You know, I say, well, you're a pastor, so man, you have to do that. That's part of the gig. Not at all. Choosing to be connected is a choice that we make every day. I have to choose to belong. Because I'm busy, I can be tired and say, I don't have time for you or for that person, but I need that. I need people speaking into my life even if they irritate me. And I'm sure that I've irritated a few as well. Someone once spoke to Mother Teresa about the whole issue of poverty. Do you know what she said? She said, the worst kind of poverty is the feeling of abandonment and loneliness. And folks, when you feel lonely, it is so easy to indulge in things that are not healthy. We read over and over in the scripture that we need to we have a need for each other. We need to be committed to each other. We need to respect each other. You see, when I meet together with you or with a small group of people, even if we're not all in agreement, I need to respect one another. That, that's just an important thing. In Romans 12 verse 10, it says, excel in showing respect for each other. It means to deeply admire the qualities in that person. And many times when we see someone who is famous or whatever, we're, we're drawn to them because we say, oh, wow, that's, that's really something. But I'm going to tell you this. The people who haven't had it all together, who maybe were at a place of brokenness, they have spoken equally as well into my life. And because I know that at many times I have just been overwhelmed with brokenness myself, people have listened to me. They've heard me. They've helped me walk through 
We desperately need each other and we need to support each other. It's one of the beautiful things we see in the early church. It's one of the things that I believe today sets the church apart is when we are there to support one another. Think of Peter's ministry called Under the Archway. And we need to provide an archway where people can recover and find hope. Listen to what the scripture says in 1 Peter 3, 8. All of you should be of one mind, full of sympathy towards each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. What an environment to be in. What an environment to stay in. Because that's where we are nurtured. That's where we find hope and help and strength. In uh, tomorrow's broadcast, I'm going to share with you about a church, the church in Philippi, who excelled in doing this. And they had a, a way of looking at each other. They realized that even though the great apostle Paul was there, he said, you know what? I'm just an equal among equals. Someone once coined the phrase, he said, at the foot of the cross, there is level ground. We are all equals. When we think of people who are broken, we think of people who have publicly said, hey, I'm dealing with addictions. It is so easy to want to throw them under the bus or to think less of them. But that's not where God calls us to be because all of us have been down. And if you're up right now, you need to reach down to help someone else. No better place for that to happen than in the context of the local church. And by the way, if you're looking for a perfect church, if you find one, don't go to it because you're going to wreck it. No one is perfect. We all need one another. Yeah, we can do a lot of things better, but we desperately need one another. So I'm a big advocate for people being connected in the church, not just showing up on Sunday and sitting there in the seat, but say, how do I get vitally involved? And folks, can I just remind you again and again that as we consider what we've been talking about today, that God loves you, he cares for you. And I hope you'll write to me today because I want to send you a book. It's called Just Start. Just start in your journey. So you know what? Write to me at mike at theperspective.tv. We'll send you some literature to help you in this journey called life. I really hope you've enjoyed the program today. I want to encourage you to become a regular partner with us here at The Perspective as we reach across the nation of Canada with the good news of Jesus Christ. I can't do it without your help. And if you go to theperspective.tv, you'll find all sorts of episodes uh, of programs. Some of my favorite ones obviously are there, and I think you'll find a few of your own as well. But you know, one program that stands out in my mind is with Dr. Pat Robertson. He recently passed away, but as you remember, he was the founder of the 700 Club. His stories of faith are inspiring, and The Power of the Holy Spirit is the last book that he has written. We want to make it available to you free of charge to the first 20 who write into our program this week. So will you write in, get a copy of Pat's book, and you know, he would say this, as I have been saying every program, that if you've not yet begun your journey with Jesus, we want to give you a book called Fresh Start. Write to us at theperspective.tv. We'll make it available to you. We'll send it to you right away. And how do I have that fresh start? Well, let's pray together right now as we wrap up today's show and say, Father, I want to ask for a fresh start with you. I want you to be my Savior and Lord. I want to trust you. I want to walk with you. Will you be there for me in my moment of need? Amen. You prayed that prayer? Write to us at theperspective.tv.